Today's segment of Sound Balming is brought to you by Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care. I cannot express to you how much we love, love, love their products. Although we use them all year, as the weather gets colder, we need these products even more. The dreaded drop in temperature, the dryness, the itchiness, and the unnecessary flakiness is inevitable. Shea Butter from Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Body Care is the only thing that works for my skin and hair needs. Not only do these products cure my dry skin, the whipped butter goes on smoothly and doesn't leave that uncomfortably thick, sticky residue. Bonus? It smells absolutely amazing. There are so many different scents to choose from too. Not only do they carry skincare products, there are products for authentic living, face, shower, hair and beard, spritzers and perfumes, and bath products. Let me tell you, we cannot even keep the stuff in the studio. The entire production team, as well as all our children, use Jimmy and Mary's product. Jimmy and Mary's take pride in creating quality, handcrafted products from simple ingredients for the entire family. Their products are made for all skin types and are 100% handmade, 100% vegan, and 100% cruelty free. Skin care is important. Moisture is key and keeping our skin and hair hydrated is essential. I cannot emphasize how much we trust Jimmy and Mary's for all of our skin care needs. Hurry on up to jimmyandmarys.com and check out their products. Did I mention service is fast and efficient too? Don't forget to mention that you heard about Jimmy and Mary's authentic skin care on Sound Balmy. Use the discount code soundbomb20 to get 15% off. That's soundbomb20 for 15% off at Jimmy and Mary's Authentic Skin Care. Hey everybody, welcome to Sound Bombing. I created this show for people who want to experience a radical, life-changing journey through the sounds of my diverse guests. I hope that each sound you hear on this show will strengthen your faith, encourage your dreams, and challenge you to awaken the greatness within you. Drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. This is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values. And a new experience. Ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Lamar Darnell Shields. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am so excited you decided to join me today. Welcome to my show. I am Lamar Darnell Shields, the creator of Sound Bombing. And my goal with this show is to introduce you to people with ideas that will help you unlock your full potential, like my next guest, David Richards. But before we bring up David Richards, you all know what time it is. Before we start any show, we always like to start with our breaths, our three breaths. As you can see, I'm rocking my exhale, inhale, repeat show. Not just because I have this amazing yoga instructor on here I'm trying to show off. Well, maybe I am, but you all know I'm an avid, avid, avid meditator, breath, breath, breather, liver of of meditation, all those things. And so for my new people, welcome to the show. To my old heads, you know what time it is. We want you to put your feet on the floor, palms facing up, sitting up straight, your mouth just slightly open and your tongue at the roof of your mouth. And we like to start out with our three breaths. So let's do this. Everything is soft. So we're going to start with our first breath. Inhale through our nostrils. Hold it for three seconds. Exhale out our mouths. Two more times. It's time for five seconds. Inhale. Hold it for five seconds. Exhale. This time we're gonna go much deeper. We're gonna go 10 seconds. Inhale. Hold it for 10 seconds. Exhale. And what is that called? 
That is called the breath of life. Welcome to my show. And I'm so honored that you decide to hang out with me today. But I'm also honored to have this amazing guest with me, joining me in the bomb shelter, David Richards. He is a business professional, life coach, yoga instructor, speaker on self-development, and international best-selling author of The Lighthouse Keeper, a story of mind master and whiskey and yoga. Find your purpose. He spent his early childhood living in various parts of the United States in three years living in Okinawa, Japan. And after graduating with a bachelor's degree in English, he was commissioned as an officer in the Marines, down to earth, insightful, and sometimes silly, just like me. He blends elements of yoga with quantum physics to bring this esoteric together with this practical practice. In doing this, David helps people embrace their life's purpose and realize and fulfilling successful, happy life. You see, embracing your life's purpose and feeling a fulfilled life is an awesome feeling, but unfortunately, it's a feeling that many people have trouble finding. Fulfillment is an easy concept on the surface, yet it's so elusive. While our inner voices are constantly rehashing situations, projecting, speculating, doubting fears, what keeps those voices at bay for good. We're gonna talk about that. Life coaching offers supremely useful tools to practice presence every single day. So today I'm so excited that you're joining me in the bomb shelter because David has a lot of insightful information to share with not only just you, but also with me. David, welcome to Sound Bombing. Let our listeners know how you're doing and let them know where you are right now. Omar, so good to be with you. Thank you so much for having me on. Really excited for this. Um, what a time we're living in and one opportunity to have a message like this to share with people. So I'm hailing from uh, just outside Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a beautiful sunny day here. I got my gym in this morning. Uh, I did some uh, prayer and, and reflection. Uh, and now I'm here with you. So couldn't be more excited to be here and, and talk about things that can help people find that purpose in their lives. I'm so glad you talked about your morning routine because I believe this and I'm sure you do based on what I read about you, based on what my amazing producer shared with me. You, I'm sure you believe this. When you win the morning, you win the day. Can you let our listeners know what that means when you say when you win the morning, you win the day? Because you did exactly the same thing I did for my morning routine. And why is it so important? Yeah, you, you you have to kind of be planful with your day because otherwise you're going to find yourself reacting to the day. And so, and it took me a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. I had a morning routine, you know, years ago, it would be, especially during this time of year, because it's football season, I would wake up maybe with an alarm, maybe not. I would kind of stroll out of bed, get some coffee, turn on ESPN, sort of sit and like, if you could call that meditation, but I'm watching ESPN for an hour and then I'm like, okay, I should get ready for work or whatever. And so, especially when I started writing books, it, came, it became necessary to look at my day earlier. That started really with looking at the morning and getting into the morning routine is so crucial because if you consciously go about, okay, how am I going to be, not necessarily what do I have to do today, but how am I going to prepare and plan for this day? And that's an inside job. And so many people don't think about that. And so I started doing priming. I would get up, I'd take a cold shower, you know, 30 seconds. And, uh, and it's obviously in North Carolina in the summertime. Oh, let's, let's stop right there. Let's okay. brother, let's stop right there. Cause All somebody right. said, did this dude just say, I wake up and I take a cold shower. Explain to my listeners the power of cold showers. Showers. I've listened to tons of people who talk Gary V. I listen to yep. Tom Bill. You all these other folks talk about cold showers. Now, most men, we talk about cold showers. You know, what we're talking about, <laughs> but I don't think David, I don't think that's what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> no, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's better than coffee because it's, uh, and it's what I was going to say was in North Carolina, obviously during the summer, cold shower is relative because the water, if it's 95 degrees outside, even in the morning, the water's not super cold. But when you get to where it's starting to be 46 or 30s in the morning, the cold takes on a different meaning. But it's really, one, it just wakes you up. It instantly wakes you up. But two, it's really great for your lymphatic system. And so that fights off disease. It helps, you know, kind of be healthy. And it's really kind of a way to kickstart your body because otherwise you're waiting for coffee to hit. And that depends on how good the coffee is or you have to go make it. But a, a shower is instantaneous. And the beauty is you can stay in there and, and kind of like almost as long as you can tolerate it. But you're going to feel your breathing is going to start to increase because it's like, oh my gosh, it's really cold. And so what I like to do is when I get in there, I control my breathing. And so that I'm kind of controlling my day from the very get go. 
So explain to me when you say you control your breathing, what does that actually mean? Because I'm thinking about this. I've lived in, I've lived and worked in very, very different worlds from Haiti, going to Africa, Puerto Rico. Uh, and so when you talk about having to not, I, I was forced to take some of these cold showers. So David, when I'm going in there, I'm, my I, this, I'm like this. So I'm sure that's not the breathing. Like if you could look at my face, I'm sure that's not the breathing you're talking about. How does one control their breathing when they're in a cold shower? I love how you talk about lymphatic mold waking you up. It's, it's stronger than coffee. It goes right to your system, yep. sort of shocks your, shocks your system. But I'm imagining this right here. People coming, because somebody's going to go and do this. They're like, oh, this dude was crazy. You know, how am I controlling my breath? It's like when you lift weights, they say, breathe, breathe, breathe. Explain to my listeners how you control your breathing while you're in the shower uh, dealing with the cold water. Yeah, it really, it all comes down to awareness, right? Because so much throughout the day, especially in this day and age, our awareness is so scattered because we're either thinking about stuff we have to do, think about stuff we've done. We're very rarely really fully in the present moment because of this sort of scattered dispersion of our awareness. And so with a cold shower, yeah, the first few times I would get in and it's... <laughs> And you're just like, oh my gosh. And then you become aware, okay, I'm in the shower. I want to slow down my breathing because I want to like, I want to control this situation. I want to respond the way I want to respond, not the way the way the water is making me respond. And so with that, you get in and it may be that first jolt, but then it's like, okay. And you're just letting the, you're letting it, you know, the cold affect you, but you're not reacting the way if you think about jumping into a cold lake or a cold swimming pool and you come up, oh my gosh, it's so cold. <laughs> You're, you're, you're fighting that, that sort of natural urge. And that's kind of a great way to say, okay, I can take control of pretty much my entire experience. Um, and for me, it starts in the morning with that cold shower. Well, I, what I do know about you, David, is you, you've been knowing about waking up early for a very long time. Thank you for your service. I know Absolutely. you are a Marine uh, and they call you all the craziest of the crazy out of all of the branches of the service. So you already had a jump start getting up early, working out in the morning as a Marine, how does a Marine Corps officer go from being a Marine Corps officer now to practice, practicing yoga? Now, what I know about the Marines, you got to, as I'm being facetious, but you all are some of the hard, 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 hardcore. And, I, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to imagine these guys and I practice yoga and I love it. Say, all right, now we're going to practice yoga. It's like when I'm about to go way back, Lynn Swan, you know, I love the, the Steelers long, long time ago until I moved to Baltimore. And the hell with the Steelers. Oh, I was going to ask you. So, oh, see, I'm a Steelers fan. My mom grew up in So, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay. So I remember when Lynn Swan started <laughs> yep. taking ballet. That was like a big deal. Yep. Like people, Lynn yeah. Swan taking ballet. Now you're seeing receivers, ballet, breathing, instructing, you know, going to breathing class and things like that. You know, how do you, how did you transition from Marine, Marine Corps to a yoga instructor? And is there a correlation between the two of them? Yeah, it's a great question. And really, it's interesting because I didn't even think about, you know, so I grew up in the military because my dad was in the Marines. And you, you mentioned it in my intro that we lived in Japan for a few years. And that was when I was in fifth grade through seventh grade. And so that's a formative time, you know, for anyone. But, but being, you know, less than probably even a tenth of a percent of the U.S. population who had that experience, this was 1979, um, I was really struck by sort of the beauty of Japanese culture and how this kind of this idea of shibumi or effortless perfection goes into everything they do. So if you've seen about the tea ceremony or some of their dancing and like there was this festival, the Oban festival, which was like a, a festival to honor their dead. And so we would hear this from the military base because there's these loud drums. So it was really, really fascinating to me. And so there is a, I think the military has a part of that in its culture, because certainly there's this idea of the warrior poet, and that was kind of the samurai piece that I took away from my time in Japan and sort of unconsciously had that in my mind as I joined the Marines, because um, I think there's got to be a, a beauty, even in something as, as brutal sometimes as warfare, and you just have to be able to find it. So it wasn't, but, but my transition into yoga wasn't um, in any way planned or designed. And it, we talked about football. So I got out of the Marines in August of 2006. I read an article about Sports Illustrated about a, somebody from the Arizona Cardinals using yoga to strengthen their midsections. And that was like this, it was kind of like the Lynn Swan moment with ballet. It was like, huh, I've never tried yoga. I don't even think I could have recognized a yoga studio when I was in the military. Um, 
but I was like, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to, I'm going to go to, I was actually staying here in North Carolina before I, I moved here. And so I went to a yoga class. It was a gentle yoga class, which means there's not, you don't do a lot of challenging poses. And Let's stop right there. I love when people say gentle yoga. Like I remember <laughs> going to a, a yoga and I'm, for all my people, David is being real nice. For all my people who's never practiced yoga. I, I remember going to my first yoga class. Oh, this is an introductory yoga class. First of all, you're coming into yoga. Like this is, this is the real deal. It might be lighter than like the second class, but you will be in there sweating, working. And David, I remember when I first started going, my buddy, you know, being a male, he was like, man, are you going there? You see all these women and they're wearing these ties. I said, let me just be real clear. I don't give a ham sandwich about those women that are in that. I'm literally trying to make sure I don't break any bone in my body, making sure I don't look stupid and crazy. And then after a while, you can care less if you look stupid or crazy. You just want to get through. The, you just want to get to the poses, and then you want to sort of get the hell up out of there because you need to do some some other things. So you came into this introductory class and walk me through what that was like. Like you, this marine guy coming in there. Like what was going on in your mind? Yeah, and you know, and it's it's a great question because I looked at it as I lifted weights a lot um, coming out of the military. Obviously, so in two thousand six, we were in the kind of heavily in the midst of the Iraq war. I mean, I think we'd, we'd, I think kind of put down the insurgency that had happened, but I had friends that were over there. Um, and so, and I had like, I'd gone to a couple of schools. I, I'd gotten two master's degrees in the Marine Corps and spent time. We were like, you know, you're researching the enemy kind of, you're looking at Al Qaeda in Iraq and like some of them were putting people in jumpsuits and, and doing horrible things. And so like, you're trying to understand this because you know at some point you might have to go over and address that and you're trying to face that reality. And so I think for me, the first thing was like yoga was the farthest thing from the military. So I went into this class and um, and it, it was, it was gentle. And so I didn't, I had no frame of reference what that meant. Mm -hmm. I just know, I thought it might be good for helping me stretch either before or after lifting weights because I like to lift heavier weights. And so the first gentle class was, it wasn't, it wasn't exceptional. It was like, I was kind of disappointed because it wasn't, I don't know that I was looking, I got out of what I expected. So two days later, I went to a different class, different style teacher. And I remember I'm on the mat. We're trying to do a bind with our hands, which is where you're locking your hands around your body in some contorted way. And I'm drenched in sweat. I'm just watching the sweat pour onto the mat. And I'm like, and it, like, it's this fascinating revelation. Like, what is going on? Like, I've never sweat this much doing lifting weights. And now I'm just pouring sweat. And so I couldn't get the bind. And the instructor comes by and she gently whispers, use your hand towel. And so I grab my hand towel and I wipe my face. And I'm like, oh, that's helpful. Thanks. And she's like, no, use it to bind your, <laughs> bind your hands. I'm like, oh, so that I put it behind my back and I bound. But, but the crazy thing was in that class, it was this, it was this huge, massive discovery. I was like, what just happened? Like, how did I go from being someone who is fit to struggling to do these things with my own body? And then there was this weird thing that I don't fully appreciate and probably until a few weeks later, but um, you know, in the military, I spent my last tour in Central America doing a lot of work, trying to help modernize governments down there or modernize their militaries. So I didn't get a lot of email. When I came to corporate America, I would get like 50 email in an, an hour or two. And it was just this noise. And so I would leave work and I remember I'd be driving home and I would just have all these to-do lists in my head about either agendas or meetings or presentations or whatever. And I found after the third or fourth time, when I got onto the yoga mat, my mind just got quiet. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what is that? Like it was still, and I was kind of present and I didn't fully even know what that meant. I just knew that like something was happening when I stepped onto the yoga mat that I wanted more of. And so quickly I kind of became hooked and I was probably going to class two or three times a week. I got my, I became an instructor a year later and then I've just been teaching ever since, but it was this, it was this real it was kind of a casual discovery that yoga is this gateway towards really deeper understanding of yourself. So how does someone who has, who has a very busy schedule uh, who really doesn't have time to get to the mat, what strategies do you have them to help them to master their mind, even if they don't have to get, if, even if they don't have the time or have not made the time to get to the yoga studio? Talk to me about mastering your mind and what are some steps that people can do? Because I always talk about approaching the mat, approaching the cushion. Those are some of the things, some of the, some of the language that I use, like I don't approach the mat when I'm sleepy because when you meditate, I tell people, if you meditate, you fall asleep, you need to take your butt to sleep. That means your body is tired. 
So what are some yep. things that you can do to sort of prepare your mind if you can't actually physically get to the yoga mat? Yeah, you know, meditation, I think, is the one thing that people first think of. And I think that's a great opportunity. It's also something that sometimes people feel a little squishy about because it's like, well, what is meditation? How do I do that? And so you can do guided meditations, which are great because they take you down a certain path. But if you want to kind of meditate yourself, then it's like, well, okay, how do I do that? And and some of that sitting still, but if you're not comfortable with getting to that place yet, or you want to build up to it, the easiest thing I tell people now is just think of pattern interrupt. If you want to get aware and sort of become conscious and start to master your mind, you got to interrupt your patterns. And we all have patterns in our lives. It could be from, you know, morning routine. Okay. That's great. But is it, is it really serving me? And if my morning routine, if I like a great example, before the pandemic hit, I would go into the office where I worked probably five days a week. And I would take the same route every day, which became my routine. So what happens is I don't have to think about where I'm driving because I've done this route 40 or 50 or 60 million times now. So I can listen to radio or I can listen to a book on Audible or I can listen to a podcast, but then I'm not really present because I'm doing all these other things or I'm thinking about what I have to do when I get to the office. Well, now if I say, okay, I'm going to go a different way to work. I'm going to go to a way that I don't normally go. Now, suddenly, what have I done? I've pulled my awareness into the present moment because I'm not familiar with this path. And so I say, okay, do I turn here? No, I think it's the next turn. But I'm paying attention to what I'm doing. The same thing, if you brush your teeth, for example, all the time with your right hand, switch to your left hand, and you're just going to become more aware. And so as we become aware aware of the patterns that we've created in our lives, which we think are somehow efficiencies, in a way they are, but if we break those down, then we start to become more aware of the self. Oh, you know what? When I brush my teeth with my left hand, it's weird, this weird feeling in my wrists. Maybe I haven't stretched that muscle or something. So you just become more aware. So I think if meditation isn't for you or you're you're kind of hesitant about doing that, start looking at the patterns in your lives, interrupt your patterns. If you want to go further, I would say journaling is so powerful and not journaling on a computer, but grabbing a pen or pencil and a pad of paper and having a conversation with yourself. Because if you can just start to write and realize that you can talk to yourself through journaling and share your own experiences and share your feelings, then you can start to look at these things like, well, oh gosh, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm not going to, yeah, why did I, why did I yell at that person today? That doesn't make sense. And so you question yourself and that's another pathway towards this mind mastery, which if you really, you know, every day, each of us has a choice we make. We make the choice to react to our circumstances or we react, we create the opportunity for us to create and design our lives. And so it's really comes down to the mindset and that starts with mind mastery. So does your mindfulness practice uh, include gratitude? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I just, someone just asked me yesterday, what's your gratitude practice? Before I set foot out of the bed, uh, I, I open my eyes. I say, I love my life. And then in the military, you always step off with your left foot. So before uh, my feet hit the ground, I think I learned this from Oprah. uh, (laughs) I say, thank you three times. I think I say, thank you three times. And then my right foot touches first because I don't want to do something that I've always done with my military foot first. Um, And then at night, I think of like, what are the three best things that happened to me today that I can be grateful for? And I think in this day and age, you know, I have a couple of articles to write for magazines for preparing for the holidays in some ways, I feel like we've sort of taken for granted time. Like we, we plan our schedules out and, oh, you know, I'm gonna do this in two weeks. No, oh, yeah, I'll do that. And, and so we sort of just put our lives on cruise control. And now that we're spending more time with ourselves at home, or a lot of us are, you're starting to find, well, there's more to me than just that schedule. And so if I can have more time to myself, I need to like explore and discover myself for. And I think that's an opportunity that a lot of us have right now. So walk me through what that actually means to... Um to really spend time with myself because we're used to being in spaces where there are a lot of people, but I don't know how to be alone. I don't, I'm listening to, I'm David, I'm listening to you through the airways, to what, whatever platform I'm using. And I don't know how to be alone by myself. I don't know how to take these walks. I don't know how to watch a movie by myself. I don't know how to spend time alone. I don't know how to do that. And, and we do have the holidays coming up and with the stats that are going up when it comes to the COVID rate, we're probably going to spend you know, few, it's probably going to be few of us at the Thanksgiving table, at the Christmas yep. table and all the other holidays. You know, how how do you what are some strategies that you have for a person who is struggling being alone and how do they enjoy themselves without anyone being around them? 
Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And it's so funny because it makes me think of, I just got out of a relationship a year ago and I realized, I knew that we'd been in the relationship for four years. It was, it was beautiful, but it was also tragic because of, we'd kind of gotten too fast in the start. And it was because like, it was still, I was still developing certainly from where I was. You know, I hadn't written my first book yet and I hadn't kind of gotten to the next level of my journey. And um, when that relationship ended, it was crushing to me because I had tried so hard and yet I knew for the first time in my life, I knew, okay, whatever's on the other side of this is going to be better. Cause I had, I didn't learn that like at an early age. I didn't know that like hardship brings results and, and something better. And so I was terrified kind of of being by myself. And yet most of us, when we think about being by ourselves, like, well, I, my, my gym is my personal time. I go to the gym, I work out, I lift. Well, that's time for you, but it's not time for yourself. And what I mean by that is like when I'm working out, I may be sorting things out in my head, what happened at work today or how this presentation go or whatever. That's not necessarily the same thing as spending time with yourself. And that's what like journaling for me has been so, so much a revelation, both in writing my second book, The Lighthouse Keeper, certainly working on my third book now, but also just for me, because it's one thing to spend a movie and spend time by yourself watching a movie. It's another thing to say, okay, what is this movie trying to tell me? Because ultimately life either happens to us or it happens for us. And if you believe life happens to us, then you have this victim mindset and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe the pandemic. You know, it's a great example. Someone in our gym, our trainer wrote a note and said, hey, here's what's happening. If you're looking to lose weight, um, here's some things you could consider. And so someone from the gym decided they didn't want to take the class this time around because they felt like he was telling them they needed to lose weight. And it was like this group email that went out like, well, no, it's not about, it's not about that. So coming back to the idea of really spending time with yourself means like, who are you? Like getting into like the core of who you are. And I think in this day and age, people are sometimes hesitant to do that because it's not instant gratification. Like it's not, it's not something you, you can open up your phone and get this immediate response to. It's like this journey that you have to take. But what you realize is when you start that journey, yeah, there's going to be some things that are painful, but there's also things that are going to be incredibly blissful and beautiful. And you know, if you have a spiritual practice or a spiritual, you know, if you have a faith, there's something more to this life than what just what we see, then you realize it's always going to end good. You just have to have the faith and be willing to do the work. And I think that's the challenge that most people have today is they distract themselves from doing that work because they're afraid of what they might find. And ultimately it's all beautiful. Yeah. We just, many of us are just busy being busy and avoiding, yep. avoiding the work. One of the things I share with people in my work, when I'm coaching or engaging individuals, when you talk about a to-do list or, or how you moving throughout the day, I always say, always start out with the tough stuff first, the things you want to avoid. If it's calling the bill collectors, get all that hard stuff out of the way. And then by the end of the day, you've, you've done a lot of the easy things. And so I think that that's important, uh, listening to what you're talking about. Now, you you talked about spending time alone and, and during this breakup, and but you also alluded to your books. You have two books, The Light Keeper, The Lighthouse Keeper, and Whiskey and Yoga. Two different titles, uh, very similar concept. What should our listeners gain from reading both of these books? And then how did you, what did the title Whiskey and Yoga come from? Yeah. So, um, so that was my, that was my first book. I wrote that in 2017 mm -hmm. and it was really, um, I was, I was kind of on, I was ready for the next step in my life. And I think like uh, we'd like the relationship I was in was a year and a half old at that point. Uh, this was like December of 2016. Um, we'd had some ups and downs already, but it was like, I was this determined creature. Like I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to plant my flag and this is going to be it. And um, I got for Christmas, I got a whiskey and yoga t-shirt because I'm a yoga instructor and, but I happen to like scotch. And so, um, it's a, it's a, it's a neat kind of cool shirt. It's that sort of ironic. Oh yeah. Um, and in January of that year, over the holidays, I was reading, uh, Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which, Great book. uh, it's, it's phenomenal, phenomenal book. And the insight that people have or had back at the, you know, back at the time is amazing. So, in the first or second chapter of the book, he asks, what is your purpose in life? And it was like this lightning bolt to my psyche. It was like purpose to my life. What are you talking about? Like I purpose. I had never asked myself that question because in the, you know, certainly growing up in the military, you're used to moving every two or three years in college, you know, college is only gonna be four years. 
And then I joined the military. And so it was like this move, move, move. And really I looked at my life in blocks of time. Okay. I'm here for two and a half years. I'm here for two, three years. This is my job. Where do I want to go next? And what do I want to do? I didn't think there was a purpose to my life. And so I, um, I remember I was just kind of so amazed that I set the book aside. I don't even think I've, I think that was probably as far as I read that time, that sitting. And I grabbed a notebook and I wrote this purpose statement about writing about helping people find their purpose. And so I started, uh, I started writing whiskey and yoga and I wrote for about four months. I got 200 pages in and uh, I realized- Now you have no writing background. Like this is all- oh, yeah. um, I, So I was an English major. Oh, you're English, that's right. English major in college. So it, it's an interesting part of my story that I've come to appreciate is I got published in high school. So I got honorable mention in a Nash, in national scholastic magazine for a short story I wrote, but I got published in like a North Carolina state magazine because I went to high school here uh, at the military base at Camp Lejeune. And, um, and then I wrote poetry and I got some poetry, like won some contests or something. Cause I was more creative and artistic. And that was part of how I dealt with moving, moving. because yeah, like it, it was, I could take creativity with me and I could kind of keep this story in my head running, even though my friends were changing every two or three years or whatever. Um, and so I wasn't going to do English in college, but um, I started international business. It was just boring. And so I went to like a guidance counselor, whatever they call them in college. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And they're like, what do you like to do? I'm like, I like to write. But so I, I was an English major, but then as soon as I joined the Marine Corps, I put it aside because I'm like, well, that's like not what Marines do. They're not going to write. <laughs> and it, it wasn't until about 10 years in that um, I had a boss. He, was, he, was a, he had been a Boston street cop and now is a military police officer, um, but he, he painted. And so he had paintings in his office that he had done. And I was blown away because up until that point, I hadn't seen or had been exposed to a lot of Marines that had artistic sides to them. And so we had a great relationship, but he kind of inspired me to start writing. So I started writing poetry again. And um, so when I started writing whiskey and yoga, it was like, I'd written 200 pages, but it's all autobiographical. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. this is going to be this amazing story. And like, I looked at where I was, it was tax time. It was like April 15th in 2017. I'd written 200 pages I was up to 1992. So I just finished like a chapter on being in Somalia with the Marine Corps. And I had this sort of revelation that no one is going to give a crap about some guy finding their purpose in life when it's going to be like a 500 page book now, because <laughs> I'm only this way through. So I threw everything out. I might still have it somewhere on a computer, but I, I but I got rid of it. Basically, I wrote a 10 chapter outline for a self-help book about helping people find their purpose. Um, it took me two months to write it. And then uh, I published in October. It went to number one on Amazon for self-help and yoga, I think. Um, and then the, the idea for Whiskey and or for the Lighthouse Keeper actually came out of that book just because it was kind of a snippet that I shared in the book that I had shared with my yoga students. Um, and then like two years later, that became the inspiration for Lighthouse Keeper. Now, out of all the things you've done, what's the biggest lesson you've learned at this point in your life? Yeah, you <laughs> that you know, we say it's, it's so funny because you look at Jim, I think the guy's name is Jim quick. He came out with a book in I love May. Jim quick, the brain guy. I yeah. talk about Jim all the time. Yes. So he came out with a book. He came out with a book called limitless, I think in March, uh, March or April. I read it like the weekend it came out It's a fascinating book blown away by the book. But it, for me, it comes down to, no dream is too big. Only your thinking, you have to adjust your thinking. Because if we say, if you talk about an idea like limitless, well, what does that mean? Like, well, limitless means, oh, I'm unlimited. Okay, well, what does that mean? And so you keep kind of digging into that and you're like, well, if, if I really believe I'm limitless, then I have to keep searching on what that means. I can't just say I'm limitless and I can run three miles in 20 minutes. Like, okay. Why not run faster than that if you're really limitless? And so for me, it's do the work to build your dream, I think is the biggest thing. And the other thing I would say that the biggest lesson I've learned is life really does happen for us. And when you take that mindset. And that, not to us. Yeah. When yeah. you take that mindset, you start to realize, okay, what can I learn from the situation? What, what has happened? Whether it's a relationship breakup, whether it's a pandemic, like what can I learn from this? And when you start saying, well, what can I learn from this? Then you keep repeating that. And you're like, what can I learn from this? 
And when you do that, you realize you're growing as a person and as a being. And then you're like, well, if, if I'm learning from everything that's happening around me, then it almost sounds like this or feels like this orchestration to life. Like there is a higher purpose or a higher value to our lives. And so it's trying to tap into that. Um, but I think those, you know, certainly life happens for us, not to us is probably the biggest thing. And so we ask ourselves those questions over and over again. And I'm sure you ask yourself those questions and your students. But David, let's get to the root of it. What is still the greatest thing that's holding people back? Like what's holding us back from our greatness? Like someone is sitting here right now is like, I'm wondering when my breakthrough is going to happen. I've had COVID. I'm dealing with poverty. There's racial injustice all over the place. My mother yep. just died. My student loans are due. What is the greatest thing holding us back? And then what can we do to get over that hump? Not go around it, not go under it, not bypass it, but to go through it. Yeah, I think it's people are afraid. And what I mean by that is I think people are afraid of losing control, right? And that's the big thing that pandemic has shown us is like we no longer have controls over our schedule. Well, it's not really true. It's what we can control. We're, we're a little more clear on really what we can control, and so I think people are afraid of, like I said, doing that work that we talked about, like that internal inside job to really develop themselves because we've created a society where we're so distracted because we're focused on other people's success. We look at Facebook and we're like, oh my gosh, everyone's living their dream life, even during the pandemic. Like, that's not right. So it's this, it's this fear that they're not going to be successful, but you're only going to like, I think it was Wayne Gretzky or someone who said like, you only miss the shots you don't take. And, or maybe it's Michael Jordan, but, but I think it's this idea that you have to understand what you can control in your life. And really what you can control in your life is your life's experience. So again, it's okay. I can react to my circumstances, which is life happening to me, or I can say, this is how I'm going to respond. And I can create and design the circumstances of, that I want to experience in this life. And so it comes back to that element of control and understanding what we can control and then sort of letting go of the things that we can't control. So out of, out of all the things that you've noticed from the people that you work with, from the travels all over the country, what would you say uh, was the biggest mind shift you had to make? So you're this little boy traveling all over because your parents are in the service. Then you go to high school and have to leave and then you're in the service. And then now you're working out and then going to the gym. What is What do you think has been your biggest mind shift that you've had to make? Yeah, I think it's I, I think it's just that, right? It's it's focusing on me and it's not focusing on me in a selfish way. And I think sometimes that's what we do. We think if, oh my gosh, if I can only lose that weight, then uh, I'll be, you know, better received or more people find me attractive or whatever. And so we do we make this change, but we're doing it for external justification or validation. And it can't be about that. It has to be about me. Like I have to be happy with me. And I think that was for me. In some ways, it was like, uh, I don't want to say I had a split personality, but part of it was, okay, as I go through this pattern of moving every couple of years, trying to really be really genuine friends with you for the time that we're together, and then knowing, certainly before the age of texting and, and Facebook and everything else, that we're probably never going to see each other again after we leave. In some sense, I created this side of me that was very passionate, very loving, very caring, but another sense, like uh, there was something that I always held back and it was like, it was hard for me to kind of bring those two together, but it was, it was realizing that I had to do that. No one was going to bring, like, no one was going to bring David out of David, no like counseling or therapy or coach. Those things are helpful, I think, but you know, any good coach is only going to ask you curious questions to help you discover yourself. I mean, that's what coaching, I think that's why coaching has become so popular because it's not about me giving you answers. It's about me asking curious questions so that you can provide your own answers because that's when that's when fulfillment happens for both of us because I genuinely helped you. I didn't give you an answer. You have this epiphany or revelation where suddenly your mindset shifts to one side or the other and like, oh my gosh, I, I can't can take, I can, can completely control my life. This is amazing. So for me, that was probably the biggest thing is just coming to appreciate that I have to own the work for making me the best person that I can possibly be. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Uh, you also just mentioned that coaching is becoming very popular. I, I just saw a Facebook ad where therapists are becoming more popular, where you can get some type of certification for therapists. I'm also noticing that more people are becoming interested in meditation, mindfulness, and yoga. If I'm new, if I'm a novice to the meditation and mindfulness arena and, I'm, and I want to get started, 
walk me through some things that I should be asking myself. Then also explain to me what are some things that I should possibly be asking a possible coach or and or a yoga instructor. And what are some things that I should be buying? Because, you know, Lululemon, let me just tell you, those prices at Lululemon, brother, are insane. Let me <laughs> just say are. that. And they're not one of our sponsors. If you want to be one, we'll change what I'm about to say. But though, why in the hell does yoga have to be so expensive, man? What's going on, David? It's, you know, I think, I think, I think a lot of ways Lululemon caters to sort of the, um, I almost want to say like the suburbanite yes. yoga community, because I think. When what about I, the like, hood I, community? Just folks is from the neighborhood. Just want to get on a mat. Well, like, you, you can't go on a Lululemon. <laughs> I just want to relax. right now. No. Well, and that's the thing. Like I wear, I wear to most of my classes, I wear, like, I think I've got a couple pair of like LeBron James. I don't know if he's with Reebok or Nike, but I got a couple of pair of his basketball shorts. Like that's my yoga apparel. I've got like t-shirts. Some of them say like, I've got one that says spiritual as hell. Yeah. I've got like a bunch. I do a lot of Spartan races. So I wear those. So mm-hmm. like, yeah, I, I don't know. I think if you're new to meditation and you want to get started, there's a couple of things you need to realize and you hit on it right. When you commented on it, if you feel relaxed to the point you fall asleep, then you shouldn't be meditating because meditating is actually this intense period of focus. Like it's really meant to be focused because that's what awareness is. Like if you sort of let your awareness awareness distill, that's okay. That's kind of what the, happens at the end of like Shavasana in, in yoga, where you just lie down and you sort of just melt, which is this beautiful, blissful feeling. But if you're trying to meditate with purpose, like I want to gather all the energy up in my body and I want to think about being as grateful as possible, right? I want to think about being as strong as possible, then I want to like, what I would do is I would, I've, I've done that where I've pulled energy from my limbs, from my, you know, arms, legs into my kind of spine. And so, okay, I want to think about being as strong as possible. And then I think about, or reflect on a time when I was super strong, whether it was strong mentally, strong spiritually, strong physically, and how I felt. And so I kind of galvanize that in this energy that I've collected. And then I send all the energy back into my body. And so that's how I become strong. Or that's how I feel strong in this particular moment. And so there's steps you can take, but I think you need to be mindful of what you want to get out of meditation. And I think that's the first thing is what I'm looking to get out of this, because you can do a thousand guided meditations. There's great apps that are out there. If you want to relax, you can do meditation for relaxation. But if you want to relax, if you want to do meditation for like self-discovery and perspective, then you really have to be focused on it because that's kind of, you have to kind of, it's, it's one of those things much like anything else you get out of it, what you put into it. And so the more focus you bring to your meditation practice, the more you can get out of it. If you're new to it and not sure how to start, there's apps. You can go on YouTube and watch some guided videos or just sit there with the the sound on and and do those guided sessions. Um, I think that's a great approach. And you don't want to be on a meditation mat with your expensive mat and clothes (laughs) and shoes and be meditating about how the hell am I going to pay for my yoga pants, my yoga shirt, my yoga socks, my towel, my blocks, everything. We don't want that to happen. So David, you have books out, you have the classes out. What is new on the horizon? What should we expect from David Richards in 2021? Yeah, so um, it's so interesting because I, my third book, uh, my working title is called Being, B-E-I-N-G. And uh, the subtitle was gonna be How to Win the Game of Your Life. I'm not sure I'm gonna go with that because Um, this year has been so um, unbelievable for so many of us in so many ways. And for me, this book, I wasn't even going to, I wasn't even kind of ready to write this book because I was marketing the lighthouse keeper in the spring, right when this hit and right when the pandemic hit and, and being was just this idea that I had, but what I've come to find out as I started. So I, in fact, I, I didn't write, I've written the book a couple of times. I've written drafts of it. I should say, I started writing on a computer and then I wrote the first chapter. I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm not going to write a conventional book because this is talking to this book is calling to me in a different way. And so I grabbed two pens. I got a notepad and I started having almost like this text conversation between these two pens. And through the course of like writing a couple different drafts, it was super heavy. But what I found is it's becoming this true love story for the 21st century. And what true love in the 21st century really means. Like we, we think that we have this idea, well, true love is... I've been married to my partner for 25 years and we've had our ups and downs, but well, is that true love? Like, like whenever I think of true love, I think of kind of fairy tales. I think of Disney fairy tales and it's like, well, how do, how does that happen? Because we only think it happens in fairy tales, but there has to be some basis for that happening. Otherwise, like 
we couldn't like we couldn't imagine necessarily like, like how does that really happen? And so for me, it became this spiritual journey on what does it really mean for true love to exist on a planet with eight billion people going through a pandemic, social injustice, racial you know inequalities, a political scene that is borderline comedy at this point yeah. and it, but yeah. it's it's comedy and it's tragedy yes. it's, it's yes. comedy because of how farcical it is but it's tragedy because at some point i used to think that america was supposed to be like a leader for the world and now we've come something less than that so um so this book has been really transformative been really exciting um i wish i could say exactly i know when it's going to be done but the book is kind of taking me on a journey and that's that's been the beautiful part so far so but i am i am planning to release it in 2021 so uh, you, you don't have a date for this, but it, it, how can our listeners get in contact with you? If, if they want to pick up two of the books that you've already written, and if they yep. want to become one of your students, let us know how we can get in contact with you, all your social media website and LinkedIn posts, everything. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, David Richards on LinkedIn. Um, and I don't know, uh, I don't know how many David Richards are there on LinkedIn, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I'm one of them. Uh, David Richards, uh, for my website. So you can sign up for my blogs. Um, there's coaching available there. If you're, you know, want to deal with creating healthy spaces at home or it's kind of just dealing with anxiety from everything that's going on, but uh, my books are available there or they're available on Amazon. Uh, and then Instagram also David Richards author. Well, David, it's a pleasure talking with you. As, as you can see, I rocked my exhale, inhale, repeat shirt. I love just, it. Just for my brother, David Richards. It was a great, great, great conversation with you. This is part one. But my favorite part of the show is called the Super Bomb Questions, where I get a chance to go a little deeper and ask you some questions that my listeners always want to know. Uh, Super Bomb Questions are brought to you by Mountain Maid. So are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So what is your favorite word? Oh, my gosh. Marvel. What I can see the Marvel stuff in the background. Man. <laughs> no, it's, 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 I know it's like product placement, but I'm not. I, I, I love it. I, I love it, man. What's your favorite quote or spiritual verse that you live by? Oh, you know, uh, reap what you sow. I think uh, I think that speaks to so many things that you have to be mindful of how you are to people because it's going to come back to you. What's your spirit animal? Oh man, uh, raven. Mm. What's your superpower? <laughs> superpower. Um, you know, I think my superpower is being a champion of love. Like I think it's just finding love in every situation and and sharing love with as many people as possible. Because I think sometimes we 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 look at love as this precious commodity that we don't want to give away. And if we just loved a little bit more, like people talked about doing in the 60s. Like, and everybody did that, this world would be transformed instantly. Like, it's, it's so incredible to me, the power of love. Speaking of love, what do you wish you had more time to do? Oh, man. You know, uh, it's, it's one of the great things about taking control of your life and mastering your mind is it, people think that means, well, I'm wealthy beyond my wildest dreams. I can do whatever I want. Well, you got to get there. Like, it doesn't happen overnight. And so for me, like, I think... I just love, I love the time that I have. Like, I don't, I don't know that I would change anything. Like, I mean, I wish, sometimes I wish the urge to write was ever present because writing, especially this year has been some of the most beautiful stuff I've ever written or read. And that's been like this transformation for me. But it doesn't always like some days I'll start writing and then I'm like, this is not going to work. I'm not writing today. And so I think that would be the one thing, probably just being able to like being in a space where I wanted to write all the time, but honoring the process. What guides your heart? Oh, man, my faith. I would say love for Christ, Um, honestly, uh, especially with what's going on, like having faith in a higher power um, and understanding that it's all like the practice of yoga is good. Like Hinduism is, it's all good. You just have to have faith and understand um, how things work upstairs. What brings you to tears of joy? Um, compassion. I just think compassion, you know, I, uh, I, I cry at some of the most beautiful movies that people would be like, what are you like Braveheart or gladiator? <laughs> like people don't think about crying during those movies, but I'm absolutely like the compassion of seeing, um, love experience, whether it's the pain of, of losing someone or the expression of finding someone. What brings you to tears of sorrow? Um, you know, I used to be, uh, I would say thinking about my dad, my dad died, uh, 
gosh, 12 years ago this November. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, but in some ways I, I like, I know that uh, I know I'll see him again at some point in this existence. So it's all good. If you were in the Mr. America talent competition, David Richards, what would your talent be? <laughs> I would say storytelling. Like I love telling stories. And um, I think in, in fact, part of this third book that I'm writing, I've actually thought about acting it out on stage um, as a one man show because um, the duality between these two voices is sometimes beautiful and surprising. And so, yeah, storytelling is, is definitely something I love. Well, if you want to hear more stories from David, go check out his website. I told you that he was going to provide us with a wealth of information. David, it has been a pleasure hanging out with you in the bomb shelter all the way from North Carolina. Brother, I appreciate you. I'm, I wish you much success. And go out and check out any and everything that David has written. And then also consider being one of, it, one of his uh, coaching clients. I think you would really appreciate it. So thanks a lot, David. Lamar, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Go Steelers. <laughs> also, I would, like, I would like to thank my super duper producer, Nicole Klimpaka, my amazing engineer, Alexander Block, Supremacy for our theme music, and all of you for listening. All of you, I could not do this without you. Keep the comments coming. Please subscribe to the show. Please subscribe to the show. Thank you all for donating uh, to the show. If you want to donate to the show, you can definitely go to buymeacupofcoffee.com and check this out. If you want to know more about me, go to go to drlds.com. And as always, believe that something wonderful is about to happen, but some people miss the message because they're too busy looking for the mess. Thanks for tuning in to Sound Bombing. Go do something. Go do something. Go do something for someone other than yourself today. Peace. The Super Bomb questions are brought to you by Mountain Made CBD. Mountain Made is changing the CBD game by offering a line of high-dose CBD tablets at an affordable price. Their products are THC-free and third-party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration and recover for rest and rehab. With nine years experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality product to help those who live an activated lifestyle. Check out mountainmade.life. Again, that's mountainmade.life to find out more about how their products can help you crush life. Remember, their products ship nationwide. Go check out their website today and follow them on social media at Mountain Made. That's the at symbol M-N-T-M-A-D-E. Our staff at Sound Balming uses Build before a morning workout, which helps to push our bodies to a whole new level on a daily basis. Try Build. Try Boost, Try Recover. Our staff is using these products to enhance our active lifestyle naturally, and we are crushing life with Mountain Made CBD. And you can too. Start today by going to mountainmade.life and ordering Build, Boost, Recover, or the multitude of other products that they have which will enhance your lifestyle. I promise you, you won't regret it.